colleague and collaborator, Tom Hanks. Probably like 1966. Think of yourself as a sophomore in high school in whatever year that was, but we're in 1966. Bob, tell us this story. So this this program I'm watching is the Johnny Carson Show. And uh, before this, I've always been fascinated with movies. I love movies. I always wanted to figure out how they did them. I didn't know. I loved watching action movies, westerns, war movies, anything with special effects in it, I'd love to watch. Um, anyways, I was watching this, this show, and Johnny's guest was Jerry Lewis. And they were sitting on the sofa, and Johnny said to Jerry Lewis, I understand you're a professor. And he said, that's right, I teach, um, I teach at USC, I teach at the School of Cinema. And I stood up in the room, and I said, School of Cinema? Does such a place even exist? And the next day, I went to the public library, and I went through all the you know, college catalogs, and I found USC, and I went to the School of Performing Arts, and then I went to the cinema department. It was only a department, obviously, back in those days. And I opened up this book, and there was a photograph of um, Alfred Hitchcock standing in front of a classroom. And I thought, I've got to go to California, and I've got to go to film school. Yes. And Sound familiar, anybody? Yes. <laughs> okay. Bob. Yeah. How did you think it worked prior to there being such a thing as a, a school for cinema? I had no idea. I didn't even. I had no idea how it, how it actually happened. And um, I remember uh, the next year seeing. Um, Bonnie and Clyde, um, which um, has a very moving scene in there where Gene Hackman gets shot. And I fell in love with these characters as we all do when we see this movie. And he was dying in this field. And I remember being just emotionally moved by this. And I, thought, and I remember having the thought at that moment, wow, there's real power here. And I gotta figure out what this power is. And so then I really started to pay, I, really, I got everything I could get my hands on to read about filmmaking, and then all of a sudden I, I found out, oh wait, there's a writer, and there's a director, and um, that's it, I just was, you know, and then, I, and then I started, you saw some of my work, I started uh, with an eight millimeter movie camera, uh, started making stop motion animation movies, and when, how old were you when you started making those movies yourself? Younger than the sophomore in high school. Yeah, it's like well, I got my yeah, a little bit like maybe a freshman. I got a I got a eight mil super eight millimeter camera that I could do one frame at a time. I was a big fan of Walt Disney, by the way, too, and all the Disney movies. So, Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I and so I, um, I I I loved animation. I was fascinated with animation. Yeah, sorry. 
Pixar. Sorry. You know, there's some, some people who say that uh, animation is the truest form of, 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 of filmmaking because you literally start from nothing and you create everything, including the lighting. Well, well, I had to do animation because I had to have my actors do what I wanted them to do. And when you're when you're when you're a freshman in high school, you know your actors get bored after like ten minutes. Of did being you work with Did you work with buddies who were in movies? I worked. I worked with my cousins and my sister. My sister was my main my main. Uh, my main, act, my main actress. Okay, you, 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 I'm going to ask some questions about the specificity of movies because I'm, we're, we're all here, and I, I, you might be as me as if you name a movie that came out in the 60s or 70s, the 80s that I saw, I could tell you the theater that I saw, right, where you live, if you like. I saw Swiss Family Robinson at the Great Lake, uh, excuse me, the Grand Lake in Oakland. I saw 2001 Space, I saw Odyssey at the Century Domes on Hegenberger Road. I saw how the West was won at the Golden Gate in San Francisco. Where did you see Bonnie and Clyde? I saw my very first, oh, my, oh, 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 there were three movie theaters in walking distance of that. I grew up on the far south side of Chicago in the shadow of the Pullman shops, and there were three movie theaters that were within walking distance of my house, the, the State, the Normal, and the Roseland. I saw my very first movie ever at the Rosen, which was The Blob. Oh, Steve McQueen. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, I saw Bonnie and Clyde at the stadium. Okay. But the Blob. By the way, who's seen The Blob recently? Anybody? Okay. The Blob. You tell me if Steve McQueen is not the most modern performance you've ever seen in that little time. He is unlike anybody else in movies at that Even in that movie. And if you don't believe it in that movie, go see Bullet. Oh, yeah. because, yeah, because Steve McQueen. All right, so The Normal? That was the thing? It was called The Normal because on Normal Avenue. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Okay. And, and by the way, none of these theaters are good anymore. Sadly. Sadly. Um, uh, about how often did you go to the movies? We actually, as we, 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 now you have to understand, these were, these were second run. Oh, that was, oh, oh yeah. Run. No, these were always scratch prints and, and I remember watching the movie, and then all of a sudden, 20 minutes into the movie, the color would shift. And I'd turn around and I'd look, and I'd say, oh, the light's coming from another port. And that's where I learned about changeovers, because the prints were, they were scratched, they were dirty, and you know. But, so like, a second round, who, who are your second round houses? Or, right? yeah, they'd be a little cheaper, maybe, but and they'd be six weeks old. At least, you know, at least. So if it was a big movie, it played in some of the theater downtown Chicago or San Francisco. Or and we always went on Tuesday night because my mother got in for free. We went to the movies on Tuesday night. Two for one. Wow. wow. And, and for that was ladies night. night. Right. So, <laughs> would you, well, I'm going to guess that would you, would you look at these movies that were coming in the second run and would you rush in order to see them because you couldn't get downtown and see them in the, in the, in the better screens on the better prints earlier on? No, I just, I, we just always had a, we, we didn't go, we, yeah. People on the, people who grew up on the south side of Chicago when I was a kid there, they did everything on the south side. Okay. Uh, so we waited for the movies there. But you, you, you went regularly. You were a regular. Yeah, it was a, it was a, yeah, it wasn't, yeah, it was a, it was a thing because then, like now, it was always the most inexpensive form of entertainment. There was interesting, uh, what Bob said when we came in, that there's, <clears throat> through a while, there's always been innovation. You know, there were, depending on, you know, what myth you read, there were some people that actually did say sound was going to ruin the art form of motion picture. Because when you looked at it, the sound was horrible in those. You look at a movie like on TCM that was made in 31 or 32 or 33, it's all this kind of Oh, yeah, well, I'm going to tell you right now. Like, and it's just terrible. And it's boring. And in, 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 in actuality, a great, at that time, a great silent film was a cinematic masterpiece. So it was this is very primitive kind of thing. Later on, of course, if you saw the early three-strike technical films in the late 1930s, it did not look great. It looked too, it looked too fake. It was colorful. So you have always been this guy that found out about something that you could do in a movie. 
Do you recall what it, 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 if you start with something like used cars or some of your early features? Let's, 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 let's applaud you. <laughs> do, you it, do you remember at, when you had the money and when you were actually making a motion picture in, in, you know, for, to make money? Uh, in order, in order to well, what, what, was, what was something that you said? Hey, well, I never, I never, no, I always learned. I never, it never, it never started that way. The way it always started was, how can we, how can we do this in some way that has never been seen before? Mm. I would gather my, my team. And then someone would say, well, there's this thing called a steady cam. Or there's this thing called, you know, a split diopter, and, you know, and those were the early things. And like, oh, okay, well, maybe we can figure out a way to do it. There was, I never walked around and said, I want to do a movie where I can use a steady camera. I never did that. Um, uh, so it was always what can serve, and I, what can serve the story first and second. Then how can we do it? And I tell you, because what I think, you know, every, you know, you know People say that I'm, you know, uh, an innovator, and I appreciate that and whatever. But what I think we're supposed to do as filmmakers is entertain. And I think that by presenting images and movies and stories to people that they've never seen before, mm -hmm. is kind of entertaining. And it doesn't. It can be. Any, it can be drama. It can be horror. It can be whatever. And okay, I'm going to tell a professional children's a story about working with Bob right now. Okay, and he just said it himself. Uh, something that that had never been, somebody has not done before. In, um, in Forrest Gump, it's probably, we were shooting on like a Friday, you know, we were down at the Wilshire Ebell Theater. That's where the, the set was, and it was for when Forrest was uh, in the hospital in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. in Vietnam. And all the scene was, was a guy walks in and says, uh, Private Gump, and I say, yes, sir. And he says, you have just been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. That's all it was in the, all the thing. And, and Bob, you know, we'd been working all day long and we probably had, what, an hour and 45 minutes left in order to get this thing? And Bob was saying, <laughs> Sorry, I've got to do an invitation. <laughs> no one does it better. Well, do my voice too. And I will, I will. We might lose some, we might use some salty language, so let's all be, both be wrong. <laughs> sitting there and understand the clock is ticking and you know it's expensive <laughs> well how the fuck are we going to do this shot <laughs> <laughs> and I said well here's an idea Bob I've made it to the and if I'm standing here or sitting and a guy comes in and says are you uh, are you right gun what if I stand at attention and then he says you've just been awarded the congressional medal of honor that's what I said to Bob. Bob said, well, hell, anybody can shoot that. <laughs> then he thought, and within, I'm going to say, a nanosecond. You know, here, you know what we're going to do? You know what we're going to do? All right, all right, all right. All right. We're gonna put the ping pong, put the ping pong table up on his side. And, and force, force will be practicing ping pong, all right? And as we hit the ball, you know what we'll do? And we'll put this little piece of tape right here, a little two-inch square piece of tape. And force will just be sitting there, and it'll go really, really fast. And we'll hit the ping pong ball right next to right in that piece of tape, right in that piece of tape. And then the guy will come in and say, you, are, you, are, are you a private gun? And you'll stop and you'll stop and stand and you say, yes, sir. And then he'll give it to you. How about that? Yeah. But then <laughs> Here's the great thing about working with Tom is he'll go, okay. And then he says, what do I do with the ball? And then it's like, well, you have to palm it. Then you have to be a, music, a magician. The, you have digital, to palm the, the ball. ping pong ball was digital. That was added. I just waved my paddle like this. <laughs> but with the standard that is that I was going to have to put the ball and the ping pong paddle on the, on the table, and the ball would have to be under the ping pong pedal, but there was no ball in the shot. So I actually had it in my hand. I was going, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it. When the time came, I just went like that. And so you see the ping pong ball under the pedal. So that is, it's one shot, happened very, very quickly. But it started because Bob's a man said, hey, but, 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 hell, but, anybody can shoot but, that. But, but, here's the thing, but here's the thing, we talk about these visual effects and stuff. They only work because the actor makes them work. And yet, and Tom never chafed under any of that 
spending him, himself in a pretzel and having to do this and that. He never said, well, it's going to destroy my performance if I have this ball in my hand, you know? Well, that, get, that gets into this thing, Bob, of how you, you said it also here. You never said, hey, there's this way of doing a shot that I want to do. It's not. It's like, what is the story here? What is the narrative? And what tool in the box or in my imagination can we use in order to tell this in the most unique way possible? So it lands. Bob does this thing, and he does it in all the films that we did. We did. He come, we all have to agree in the cast what the red dot is in the scene. We get together for weeks, all everybody, all the cast members and the writer, and we talk for weeks. We start at the first page, and we work through the script, and if we get to the end of it, we go back to the first page again and continuously work through the script. And everybody can comment on anything. Sally Field could talk about Bob. Eric Roth, who wrote it, could talk. We could all talk about any scene that we were in, anything that was in the movie, because Bob was always saying, oh, look, on the day, when the sun is shining and going down and the clock is ticking, there can be no confusion about what that red dot is, what must happen in the scene. And what we don't, I mean, we could talk about that till the cows come home, but what the translation goes is through Bob's head is how to shoot it. And shooting it can often re require something that we can't imagine because we're just a bunch of stupid actors who want close-ups, you know. And, uh, we all just hear blah 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 blah. My line, bullshit. <laughs> and you have to take you have to take into account. And you know, you you no actor can be intimidated by the reality. Did you just did you by the way? Did you just notice the first shot there, Marty McFly? Uh, uh, Michael J. Fox. This is what you all, a lot of times you have to do this in a Bob Zemeckis movie. Did you see the way he did it? He was like, he was down like this, and he, he went up. <laughs> and Bob will say, just a little slower. <laughs> because he knows what we're all going to be looking at. And so there is a physicality along with everything else, because the other thing is what thing you said when we were starting working so. And it's almost true. Editing, the editor of Bob's movies, for much of the movie, just has to remove the slates, because it all works so long. The scene, the red dot, is taken care of in a shot. And then that's it. You even, you even apologize when you have to shoot coverage, right? right? We know what coverage is, right? Close-ups, two shots, reverses. You know, all the round and round. You don't like to do that. Uh, sometimes it's sometimes it's important. You know, you have to show the audience where the gun is. You know, you have to you, know, you, have, to, you have to cut to that. Um, but my feeling about it is is that if the scene if the scene has um, if the scene's well written and you have act, you know really really competent talented actors, there is a um, there's an energy uh, having the actors all in the same frame performing at the same time um, without imposing the, uh, the uh, tool of editing on it, mm -hmm. unless you absolutely need to. And if you can make it work, I think it's really, it's really much more powerful than um, cutting around. Well, you, you end up losing fluidity and malleability, though. So, like, like if uh, yeah, you have to be confident that the scenes work. Exactly. So you have to. So you have to feel it. You have to because if, so no. So there are times you say, okay, let's try this in one, and you do it, and I'm there sitting there. Oh, I'm gonna have to cover this because uh, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, this is. Mm, I don't think I don't think this I don't think this scene's gonna make it in its entirety in the final movie. I got to figure out a way here. Take thirty seconds out of the middle of this, and so then I'll say, "Okay, well, now we got to we got to do some coverage just to be able to just to be able to uh, have that happen." So it all comes down to being a hundred percent comfortable with um, with the with the uh, with the with the scene that you're shooting. What happens, Bob? Do you walk away from a a day a scene, uh, the day's work, satisfied? 100% or 
Or do you sometimes you walk away from So I've been doing these things for film schools my whole life, you know, talking about, and, and when I'm asked, like, you know, you, what, what does a director do? And my answer is, he compromises. <laughs> and that's what I do. Every single day, I compromise. I get in the car, and, I, and I'm doing a shot list, and I've got this magnificent idea for shooting this, this scene. I've got like a, a list of 20 setups that are gonna be fantastic. By lunch, we haven't got the first setup yet. <laughs> and then by four o'clock, I'm there going, I just gotta get enough coverage to put this thing together. Right, and and that's and so it's just compromise, compromise, compromise. Because you're going to get there, and it's going to go. Oh yeah, so hmm. I thought the I thought the door was going to be on that side of the room. Okay, now it's on this side of the room. And, oh wait, that one doesn't open. And, you know, so it's like every day you're in there, and you're just sort of compromising your vision. But what you got to do is you got to take that and try to make it even better than what you've got. You know, by using that. You know, you. you that, that's kind of like, um, <laughs> you don't have that problem in animated movies, <laughs> right? <laughs> because you're every, you do everything that you wanted to do, but then you gotta think of everything. So what you don't, what, what you get when you're making a live action movie is you get these magnificent accidents. Mm -hmm. And you get, you have an actor, you know, read a line that is beyond what you ever thought. And you go, oh my God, that's fantastic. I, want, I should, I gotta do that, I gotta have him do that in a close-up. Or, you'll have a beautiful, you'll, very few times this happens, you'll have a magnificent sunset, and you actually can get the shot in time. Usually you have a magnificent sunset, but they don't get the camera on fast enough, there's a problem, oh, you gotta get the, you know, there's something that they left in the truck, you have to yeah. go get it, and then the sun goes down, and you know, then now your beautiful sunset shot is a gray sky. That's usually what happens, but you know, it's it's all good. We're all, we're 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 here. We're, we're I said we're on the dog and pony show, right? The celebrity deal train right now, and all of America will not be able to escape references to here between now and November first. No matter how much how little TV you watch, you can block um, uh, uh, billboards out of your vision and driving. You will not be able to escape references to here. So I apologize right off the bat. The merciless uh, merchandising campaign that it marketed. The whole America hostage got that until they see uh, they see some version of the movie. Um, um, this here came about. We'll, and we'll see a clip later on. Here it came about because my involvement in it, anyway. You, 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 when did you start working on here uh, as an idea? I, you and I were talking about the truffle hunters. Yes. And <laughs> you were talking, and I was saying, did you see that movie? It's all the, every scene takes place in this magnificent tableau. And you said, yes, that's the kind of thing that we should do. You would well, say we should do something that's like, you know that's so innovative. Right, I'm going to do another Bob Demeckis imitation. Okay, can you, can you handle this? All right. So long time ago, uh, we might have been working on something. I can't remember. Bob Demeckis. Oh, man, I saw, I saw this. I saw this crazy thing. I was watching the documentary, and uh, and uh, uh, it starts with a shot. And I couldn't figure out how did how did they, how did they get that shot? What is the shot? It was like in the back of some Jeep, and it was going down this bumpy road. You could see the driver, and there's palm fronds, and it's raining, and it's crazy. And the camera's like looking out the window, and looking at the gate, and coming around, and going down, and looking around. And I kept like, how, how did they get this rig inside the back of this Jeep? I can't figure out. How did they get this shot? What did they use? What kind of camera was it? And then the car stops, and it all turns around, and the camera's whipping around like crazy. And the guy driver comes around, and he comes out, and he opens the back of it, and the camera leaf comes out of the Jeep, and it's suddenly down in the weeds, and I realize that. They put the camera on a dog! <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, that was in the trouble hunt. That was in the trouble hunt. <laughs> exactly. And so I end up watching this odd documentary called The Truffle Hunter. It's kind of like, what's on? You want to watch that? No, you want to watch that? No, you want to watch that? Oh, it's a documentary. Ah, I, don't know. I did not know it. And when, when it started with this Jeep going down the thing and the camera went around, I. I I said, I said to my wife, this is the scene that Bob talked about! <laughs> and then we watched the rest of the movie, and so much of it is told in these mag... I, I, 
you just call them tableaus that go on for a very long time, eight, nine, 10 minutes. There's one in there with just a guy being served eggs with truffles in a restaurant. The camera never moves. And we, we, were, we were making, we were making Pinocchio. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> we were making Pinocchio in, 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 right next, in a Zeppelin hangar right next to where they were making the Batman. That They were shooting that in the other Zeppelin hangar. I kept saying, hey, let's have a gang fight with the cast <laughs> versus the Batman. I think it would have been, you know, we'll take on those guys playing cops from Gotham City because uh, we'll have our little children from the, uh, from the uh, 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 where was I going with this? Oh, and it was there that we were sitting around talking to when I mentioned this about the trouble hunters. We were in your office. I said, I wonder if we could do that. I said, and you literally said, why don't you just ask that question? Because you had the graphic novel by Richard McGuire. McGuire, and you had a draft of the script. You were no, we didn't have a draft. Uh, you no, did not have a No, no, I, no. I, all I had was the, was the novel, and you went and got it that night on Kindle yes. at the hotel. That's right. The next morning, you came in and said, this is fantastic. And I said, great. I was, you know, let, let me, let's finish this movie. I'll start thinking about it. Literally, when we wrapped, I got a call from Eric Roth saying, what's going on? What are you doing? And I said, you know, funny you should call right now because Tom and I were just talking about this graphic novel called Here. And he said, oh, let me, I don't know what it is. Let me find out. You've got it that. Anybody familiar with it? Anybody familiar with the graphic novel? Okay. No one? Just, okay. You'll, you'll, you'll be familiar. I had, to look, I had to like read it through like three times in order right. to figure out. Anyway, that's, that was the birth of it. Okay. okay. And, and we're going to get to it. We will. We, we, we will. We will in fact get to it. What's that? Am I I supposed to be these? I think these are. Oh, these, these are them. Okay. I had, I had this. Okay. All right. Should we get to this now? Time? Are we okay timing? Staff, crack staff. Yeah. Is it time to do the time to introduce the clippy clips? Okay, all right, all right, all right. All right. There's some clip. All right, so here's what, here's what I want to say. We can just do one right after the wait, other. Wait, wait, no. We'll have a we'll have 30 seconds in order to talk about okay. it. Um, because we here is a movie that is unlike anything you have seen. Once you see it, you will have seen it, and it'll be familiar to it. Here we're going to show three clips prior to the clip of here. But each one of these movies, before you saw them, were unlike anything you had ever seen. So you're seeing some combination of Bob's imagination, the screenwriting, the narrative, the narrative story technique, the cinematic aspect, the special effects, everything melded into like a fine uh, shovel of cards, into an absolutely 100% unique movie to you, and just think about, if you can, the movie theater that you saw these in when they first came out. Let's roll, I'm not gonna tell you what they are because you'll recognize them instantly. Let's roll with the clip number one. Okay, just out loud, everybody just say the theater that you remember seeing that movie in for the first time. Just say it out loud. If you can remember Ridgewood Theater, New oh, Jersey. There you go. Oh, great. As memorable a night in the movies as you were going to have because you had not seen that amalgam of so many things really ever before, special effects. The most elaborate effect in that scene is when the license plate is spinning. <laughs> because it was built on a special table that we had built out on the parking lot of the back lot at Universal we, with asphalt on it, it had a motor device underneath with a little pin that retracted it, so it spun the, it spun the license plate, and we had to put the flame on it in that insert, it spun the license plate, the little rod retracted and flipped the license plate down. See, other filmmakers would have been satisfied with just, you know, the prop guy spinning a metal plate. <laughs> Yeah, well, that would have never worked. All right, let's also talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are you know, you say, yeah, fine, everybody's going to have to make movies. How many, how many, how many nights in a row out of that shopping center did you shoot that? Well, uh, well the, the, we shot the whole movie at night. Yeah. <laughs> because poor Michael J. was doing the yeah, ties during the day. So, so, uh, so that actually gets into this whole other aspect of making movies, is that it, there is a human cost to doing this. This, this takes time and effort and exhaustion, and you have to be pushed to the place where it's a marathon. All of you know, movie making is very time intensive. 
It really is. It just takes a lot, a lot of time to make a movie. It, it like, just, just, just the, 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 the plants and stuff, stuff like that. that. They go through there. And how many layers to that one few seconds of, of a movie? What are you asking? Well, how many, how, how many elements went into just like that one shot? Of well, you had to have the, you had to have the art department build the asphalt. You had to have the uh, uh, physical effects guys rig, build the rig to make it work, test it. Then you had to have the guys come in and lay the fire down, and then the camera department had to come and light it so it matched. And it was like you know. A, it took a whole day to do that. that that's, that's a lot of stuff. stuff. Okay, we're going to go into the next clip here of the movie. Amazing. Yeah, we agree. Yes. Uh, here's another one that you did. You had never seen this movie until you sat down in this movie. Yeah. Clip number two. Well, there was there were so many elements to this. They built a huge they hit a huge truss on wheels on things, and and uh, Michael T was actually suspended uh, by wires and cables with just enough slack so that I had to lift his body up just a little bit, but then slide it along this long, 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 long track. And all of that was taken out somehow in the course of the videos. We were never in danger in there. The, the, those explosions happened on a different day. Uh, different. We weren't even anywhere near it. But it doesn't really matter, does it? Because there's other elements. If we really were by a river, those really were helicopters that were coming down. And uh, it, it still does. Yeah. But there, this is the thing I talked about, Bob, because there is a technical aspect. But originally, the Vietnam, the Vietnam sequences in the original script, when we first got into the show, were essentially comedy pieces. They were like Buck Private, you know, like Abbott Costello. And Gary Sinise, in his indomitable way, just made no way you can have Vietnam in this movie and not take it from mud if I get serious. <laughs> and Bob says, well, how would we do that? So why don't we have like goof in their way through this thing? But, you know, I, I, it, wouldn't, wouldn't he be, wouldn't he kind of like be able to survive boot camp just because he's really good at doing what he's told? <laughs> he, he's so good at doing what he's told, he'll be the best private in boot camp. He'll, he'll, put the, he'll put his rifle together faster than anybody else. And that's literally what ended up happening. What we have now is this very serious move out of Vietnam that is in the middle of this whole other kind of move. Absolutely, really like if a modern man was really stuck on a, des a deserted island, not with the girl, the pirates don't show up. Remember that conversation? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, what would it really be like? Is it possible to make a movie that would be absolutely real and, and what his struggle would be in, in complete reality? So that is that is what made me fall in love with with that movie. Um, the other thing is, um, for any anyone who is interested in looking at the movie from a directorial style point of view, we didn't bring a dolly, we didn't bring any lights, um, we brought only a camera and a tripod to Fiji, and it was interesting. What, what we came up with was the idea that the camera only moves on the lens nodal point, pans and tilts, in the whole time that we're on the island. And, and then Tom had to work within that frame, so the camera would start moving, like a surveillance camera. It never followed Tom. It did its own thing, and Tom had to work within that frame. Um, and, uh, but then when, once we got off the island, and of course there was no music on the island. 
It was only sound effects. Surf and wind. Yeah, there's a lot packed into that because in that we can, we worked on that for six years. Bill Royals and I, uh, I sort of liked that the first act. Bill Royals got in, came in, and he brought the second act. And then uh, we had to, we had, we talked to you twice, and then we came back like a year and a half later, and you said, I can't get that thing. But we did not have that third act, and you brought in the concept of facing yourself that. And in that scene, two of the key elements of life are, are created. One is fire, shelter, all water, uh, food, and fire. Uh, fire is one, but then the fifth element to stay alive is company, and that's the birth of Wilson. That you said, I think he's got to come out of Chuck somehow, and we came up with the blood on the volleyball. And Tom designed it. <laughs> because no, because that, I, and I, and I, I kept saying that to you. I said the only he comes up, he comes from you. He's physically your blood. You have to, you have to draw. You and 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 you kept putting it off and putting it off. And then I think the the morning of, he sat down with a piece of cloth and the red paint and then he and he here he is. Two things, happened. Happened. Yeah. Two things happened. Two things happened. Robin, our prop guy, immediately scooped it up and went off and made like 27 inches. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like 20 minutes. Like, hey, Robin, here it is. And as far as the island goes, you see those cutaways to Wilson? Those were my only shots off. <laughs> those were, that was the only time I was not on camera. So, okay, John, we're going to get Wilson's coverage. <laughs> I, got, I got back to my hut that they were building. <laughs> Okay, time to raise it. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot happened there. Okay. All right. Um, now we're going to come around to uh, to here. Um, the, those those three movies, Eclipse. I think the, the it's the amalgam of Bob's narrative, the tools that he uses in order to make it, the collaboration that he always had with all of the actors that involved, and that magnificent serendipity that goes into. The nature of a, of a shooting day. Um, here, uh, which we're going to see a clip from now, is almost the antithesis of an awful lot of that. Uh, very specific sets with all sorts of moving platforms and whatnot in order in order to make it helpful. Uh, uh, so much so that we we had a one week workshop uh, at a hotel in Santa Monica where we just set up a mock up of the camera position. And the set, and we just workshop to see how actually how intricate is this going to be, and to put the scenes up, and to put the scenes up and make sure that they were working. Right, right. So, so it's kind of like it was kind of like theater rehearsals. It was like it was like a black box theater that we did. Right, except but except that we shot it, and and what we what was left over was going to last forever. So there were there were times when we went to twenty seven takes, full takes. 47 takes, takes in which we, you know, fell apart with that. But it was impossible to walk away until serendipity was almost run out of it, outside of stuff that we tried to record. So it's going to be really interesting to see these clips out of context, because, you know, has anyone here seen the movie? I don't think you have, right? No. Okay. No, you don't have. Okay. Well, are you guys all AFI students? Or, or, or? No. 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 So you just, you just love movies? Right? Yeah. Okay. How many people love movies? <laughs> Here's a clip from a movie. <laughs> Here's a clip of a movie that uh, will be in your theaters very soon. I want you to say, and we do not and will not have for quite some time a deal with the streamers because this is not mandatory. <laughs> 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 uh, is, uh, um, is Bill Block here? Bill Block. Are you no, no, I don't think he's here. Oh, okay, okay. I, I thought he might be here. Okay. I just wanted to say that Bill Block, who was the the bravest man in Hollywood, who had the conviction and courage to make this movie, I was going to give him a shot. Yeah. Now, also in that, you don't see the cast of everybody who has ever been alive on planet Earth, because it begins with the era of the dinosaurs. There's Na Native Americans. There's other families that live in that house while it's being born. Uh, while it's being built, uh, you, it's, we, there, you get a sense of what Bob was able to do as far as going the transitions from one to the next. But there's other times where the walls disappear and a primordial forest uh, uh, grows up and two people fall in love about 800 years. So ago. the audience's view 
is in one fixed position on the earth. And time and life passes past the camera. And that's and that's what the and 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 that's how we we made the movie. And that's what the that's what you just saw. And that's how we do that. And we all owe it. To Johnny Carson and Jerry Lewis. Yeah, there you go. Or 1960, whatever they say, they said the thing is a school or set of a ball. Bob Trebek ladies and gentlemen. Up a little bit. Okay, all right. Did you notice how young uh, Robin and I? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everybody, let's just put it this way. A lot of people are shitting their pants because you could say that this is a use of quote unquote AI. The, uh, the, the visual, the way they de age this is in two very specific parts. One is thanks to the speed with which the tools work at now literally the size of files and the speed of which computer works. Between myself and Robin, Paul Bettany and also Rachel, they, they took eight million images of us from the web. They scraped the web for photos of us in every era that we've ever been. Every, every event we've known, every movie still, every family photo that might have existed anywhere. And they put that into the into the box. See, what's it? What, what is it? Deep fake technology, whatever you want to call it. Oh, very fast computing. Very okay. <laughs> leave it at that. Very, very fast computing. <laughs> then they would create that look of 17 and 22 and 27 and 35. Then uh, we went into hair and makeup for the same amount of time that we go into hair and makeup for a standard movie. Very specific ways. My ears were removed up and back and glued to the side of the head. We had all sorts of pinching going on because the amount of skin that we showed was going to show up in the, in the process and become, uh, what, I guess it was more expensive. So this combination of this incredibly fast computing and the same makeup techniques that have been, been used since Lynn, uh, you know, Lon Chaney was performing in, in, the, in the silence. Was it? But the thing that is amazing about it it happened in real time. We did not have to wait for eight months of post-production. There were two monitors on the set. One was the actual feed from, from the lens, and the other was just a nanosecond slower of us defaked. So we could see ourselves in real time, right then and there, how we were moving, what our body, body position was. I'm gonna tell you right now. As you can see, a 17-year-old leaps up off the couch with a different uh, alacrity than a 68-year-old man. <laughs> and we had to, we had to, we had to make it happen. All the stuff you see, Bob always said, well, you walk into your own close-up and you walk off. And that sounds like really like super easy. It's math. It's math and it's stagehands moving stuff in. It's like, but like we said earlier, the reason that the illusion of any, any film illusion, I mean, you know, uh, my 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 favorite visual effect in cinema is the close-up because it's a it's a it's a special effect. You can't see it anywhere in life. You can only see it in a movie, um, and it's completely fake. I mean, you know, I mean, you ever see an actor? You all have done it on your sets. I mean, it's the most ridiculous thing. You're looking at a piece of tape. You got 20 guys surrounding you wearing you know shorts, and you got to emote you know, your, your, your emotion, and, and, and that's what it is. But anyway, getting back to this, the illusion works because of the performance. That's what makes it, that's what makes it work. I mean, Tom and Robin were able, and, all, and, 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 and Paul and Kelly, they were able to you know, look at the playback, see themselves very glitchy, but, the, but, but in, in you know, youth makeup, in uh, real time, and go back and say, "Oh God, yeah, I gotta, I gotta move quicker. I gotta, I gotta raise my voice a little bit more, and and actually hone the performance to actually perform. It's exactly as if they had old age makeup on, and they had to move like they were 30 years older. 
they would look at the playback and go, oh yeah, I gotta be a little bit more bent over. I gotta move a little slower. This is the same thing, but on the other direction. The other thing too is that everything in the frame works, as you notice, the stuff that's on TV and the stuff that's out the window. There's, we have scenes where there's 22 people in that same living room and everybody, everybody is identifiable. Everybody does something that is recognizable in the, in the kind of like miasma uh, a movement uh, that goes uh, that goes along in the scene. The um, can you talk about the, the Frank Capra quote? <clears throat> um, based on what we did here, because it was it was essentially one as we say, in the making of it's all in it's all in one it's one setup. I went back and looked at a bunch of Preston Sturgis films because um, so much of his stories are told one set one one setup. Uh, uh, you can do the same thing with like the Philadelphia story with James Stewart and Terry Grant. The camera does not move, but there's so much dialogue and intent um, in it that you, if, if you're looking at it from a purely pace aspect of it or the demand of a performance, what it means is you pick up your cues, you do not wait, you don't allow yourself that time to think, which is a luxury when you know it's going to be cut into close up to two shots. We, only, we can only do it in real time. And one of the things we noticed was this fascinating thing. We would think, we, do, we would do it regularly, and it would just be slow as last. So we would literally take, you guys need to take 45 seconds out of this scene. All right, well, let's speed it up. We got down to the point where we thought we were just talking way too fast. But Bob told the story about the camera. Yeah, well, it, I think it's in his book, uh, Name Above the Title, where the early, you know, the, the Right after sound came into uh, came into the movies, the fil uh, early filmmakers were talking about how they came up with they, they came up with the, the uh, understanding that once the actors were uh, reduced to two dimensions and then magnified on the screen, that it seemed to slow their performances down. So they would tell the actors to accelerate their performance when they were shooting so that once it, 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 it was put on the screen, it felt like it was natural. And we were seeing that happen. Yeah, right. We discovered that when we were doing the week-long uh, just uh, workshop back in the, in the hotel. Because Bob was saying, well, it's kind of like theater. It's kind of like theater. I said, Bob, even with theater, man, you got specials and you got motion and you got all this kind of stuff that gives you a type of focus. And what we had there, important stuff happens with someone who's all the way back looking out the window and they do not. I mean, I'm there with the birth of babies and the Native American, you know, scenes where a baby is born, you know, 800 years ago. And it happens at a distance, but it's just the nature of the cinematic palette here that it lands on you with the same sort of weight that it would be if you had a bunch of different cuts and shot the thing all day. I'll tell you, who, who, who's actors in here? Any, any actors? All right, so you know how you work all morning long on the master and you think, wow, we got the master. And you're gonna spend the rest of the goddamn day carving it up into the coverage. And you just think, we're gonna have to recreate these moments until nine o'clock tonight. And we'll have to constantly be remade up. We're gonna have to get back to the motive place again. We're gonna have to go there. If it's angry, you gotta have the energy. If it's sad, you gotta have the emotions. It is, it is, it's, it's, bone, it's bone chilling. The luxury, at the same time, the pressure of doing this 17 or 42 times and then being able to walk away, not having to go back and recreate that stuff. Uh, Robin and I have both said we are so spoiled. We're never going to want to make a movie the old-fashioned way ever again. Because you give it, you give it at 100% then, and you don't have to go and regurgitate 100% at 5:30 in the evening, four hours after. It, it was it's it's a, it was uh, it's an incredible workout for for an act. Uh, so we hope you enjoy it when you see it. And and AFI and uh, keep going. Uh, here you go. Uh, isn't it great to have a, 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 a school of cinema? Yeah. Ooh. Because Ooh. Thank you, everybody. How many people are here, students of AFI? It, uh, mm -hmm. Enough of them, okay, all right. So, hey, come on, get in there and kick some ass. Okay? <laughs> Drag us kicking and screaming into the next millennium. Yeah. My name is Tom. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.